Yes, I tell you what, we are excited about what's happening in Giddings, Texas. And uh, we want to welcome our campus uh, there in Giddings. They're watching with us. So uh, we're, we're excited to be able to, uh, to welcome you and how proud we are of you. Now, we're going to get right into this morning's message. And, uh, you know, I've got a couple of Easter messages. I just want you to let, to let you know. We've been talking about Easter so much, and we've been heading towards Easter. You know, I've been praying, God, what would you have me share for Easter? And you know, it's interesting when the message keeps growing and growing and growing, we can either do it in two parts or three parts, or we could be here all day, you know, and some of you are going, yeah, let's break it up in a couple parts. And so today I just want to, I just want to go into, uh, you know, an, an Easter message, so to speak. And I want to share with you, this one is very near and dear to my heart because the truth is, it's the Bible passage. We're going to talk about one of the Bible passages that was very instrumental in having me step out of my comfort zone, step out of my security, and start a church. See, it's interesting because I, I was raised and born in a Christian home, but not just any Christian home. I was a PK. How many of you know what a PK is? preacher's kid or pastor's kid, and PKs can grow up a little weird because, and, and I'm just going to be honest, not all of us turn out so well. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the better ones, I, I think. You know, I've known some preacher's kids that are like, oh man, they're terrible, right? Well, I was terrible, but God had the last say, and, uh, but, but I can remember growing up with a, with, a, with a little bit of pressure because there's a lot of expectations on preacher's kids. Not only expectation to live up to, to what the congregation thinks you should be living up to, but there's also the expectation that somehow, some way, you might follow in your father's footsteps. And I'll give you this, I love my father, and I respect him tremendously. As a matter of fact, I've always admired his, his dedication to the Lord and how he'll go into... Uh, even the inner city and plant churches where it's not cool, it's not, you know, in vogue, it's not where everybody wants to plant, but he'll plant and, and he'll minister in tough areas. And that always, always gained my respect. But I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to be that. I said, that's good and that's great for him, but, but I feel like I have something else. And I'll never forget the day I was driving with him to, to school and we're listening to Focus on the Family. How many of you know Dr. Dobson is, and, and Dr. Dobson was talking, and he was fielding a call from a young man who was in his 20s, who was basically, he was basically communicating my very sentiment and my fear and my anxiety about having to be called into the ministry, or having this calling upon my life that I didn't necessarily want, and Dr. Dobson said this, that set me free, he said, son, relax, don't worry, God's not calling you. And I said, okay, why? And, and the young man asked the very same question I would have asked, why? And he says, because of your heart. And I'm not, I'm not saying your heart is bad. I'm saying that when God calls you, you have a deep desire and a, and, a, and, and a want to serve him. And you don't have that. I can assure you, God is not calling you. And he won't call you with that heart and with that attitude or with, with where you're at. And he wasn't putting the guy down. He was just setting him free, saying, hey, go and live a good Christian life, but you're not called the pastor. And I remember walking out of that car and feeling so light and free. And I was like, yes, man, now let's, let's do this thing called life now. You know, I don't have to worry about being a pastor. And I, and I can remember that things would change drastically as God began to call me and began to change my heart, and it wasn't long, I should say it was, it was long. I was probably about 15 then, and it was about 25, 10 more years, when God would begin to call me and start to shape me. And, and it, it was through a message that Marcos Witt preached, and Marcos Witt's very first message, because he wasn't a preacher, as a matter of fact, that's what he said, he, he kept apologizing because he said, you know, this might not be any good, but to me, it was God sent. And it's like he was speaking directly at me, and he told the story of Peter, and today I want to tell you that story of Peter, and I'm not going to preach Marcos' message, because that was a very different message for a different time. I'm going to preach to you my message that God has placed on my heart, but the story is the story of Peter walking with Jesus. And so the story goes that Jesus departed 
to try to find a place to mourn. See, his cousin John the Baptist had just been beheaded and he had just died and he was, he was hurt in his heart and he wanted to mourn and spend some time with the Lord and he needed to be recharged. And so as he went off to be alone, the crowds followed him and we'll talk more about that in a second. But, and after the crowds had finally left, he sends his disciples on ahead of him across the Sea of Galilee. And you say, the Sea of Galilee, that sounds big. It is, it's a very big lake as a matter of fact. It's not actually a sea, it's a lake. But it's very large, and so he sends them on ahead, and he says, I'll catch up with you later. The only thing is there was only one boat. So the boys take, on, take the boat on, and then sometime in the middle of the night, they see something. Now, they hadn't made much headway, and one of the reasons they hadn't made much headway is because it was choppy, and uh, a storm seemed to be blowing in, and they were having a lot of resistance, and they were getting a little nervous. Because the truth is you can get out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and find yourself in real trouble, especially in the small boats that they used. And just then they see something, some kind of, some kind of phantom looking thing walking upon the water, moving towards them. How many of you would have thought ghost? That's probably, yeah, a ghost. How many of you would have thought, oh yeah, that's my friend Jesus? I mean, this is the thing, you know, sometimes we just skip over that and we go, oh yeah, of course they would think it's Jesus. How many of you would think like, yeah, that's Pastor Chris just walking on the water? Or that's, you know, my father or my friend or my uncle. You know, they're really good Christians and that's what they do. They just walk on the water. So this was a huge deal. And so they look and they're trying to identify who it is. And one of them says, I think it's Jesus. And so they call out to Jesus, is that you, Jesus? And the next thing you know, you have Peter getting out of the boat. I mean, he's literally getting out of the boat. He's rocking it and everybody's kind of complaining and thinking, who do you think you are? And Peter's like, hush, I'm going for this. And he's getting out of the boat. He's, what must he be thinking? I mean, I want you to think about this with me, Arlo. I want you to really get this. Giddings, I want you to really get this. What was Peter thinking? Why would he ever assume that he could walk on water? I mean, that's a pretty good question, isn't it? Why would he, where would he get the idea that somehow he could walk on water? See, in order to truly understand this, you've got to go back and understand and tie together what we were talking about last week. And some of you might say, well, Pastor, I wasn't here last week. Some of you might say, yeah, I was here, but I don't really recall what you're talking about. We talked about a lot of things. So well, I'm going to remind you, last week we talked about Jesus being the way. But not just any way, the better way. And that he came to show us a better way. And that's the way it pertained to Jesus, all the historical facts that we talked about. Today I'm going to remind you of some of those historical facts and how they pertain to, Je to, to Peter walking on water. See, Peter had been brought up in a system where they believed they had gotten communication directly from God, that God had called a man of faith by the name of Abraham and down through, the, down through the line, his children had preserved God's word from Moses and, and on forward. And so they would grow up studying God's word. As a matter of fact, the very first First phase of study was at four years old, four to five years old, what was called Beth Sefer. And Beth Sefer, they would enter school and they would study the first five books of the Bible, what was to them called the Torah, the law. And you might say, well, what does the Torah mean? It means God's guidance, God's book, God's rules, God's law. And some would say God's way, the way. So you can see when when Peter and the boys were listening to Jesus and he said, I am the way, it made perfect sense to them because they were used to hearing about the way. And so at five years old, they would begin to understand the way. And it was the first five books of the Bible and they would memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And some of us complain about memorizing just salvation verses. You know, they would memorize for the first five years of their life. And see, this is what would happen. The guys that were the very best at memorizing, the guys that really just had a natural aptitude for this would be selected to go on to the next stage. And the next stage would happen at around 10 years old. It was called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah was not just memorizing, but truly understanding the oral Torah and the, the interpretation and the tradition behind it. 
And so they wouldn't just be memorizing at this point, they would begin to make heads or tails of it. And then it would lead to the next part. But you see what's happening is the best of the best of the best go on to the next step. And every time the crowd gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, doesn't it? Those that are selected, those that are considered the chosen, the few, the proud, the Marines. No, I'm just kidding. Those that are, that, are, that are selected for Beth Midrash. And Beth Midrash would not just preoccupy itself with the commandments, but understanding the commandments and the tradition behind the commandments, but also all of the writings of the prophets. So now you have the entire Old Testament. Every single writing, those would just be, it would just be weeding people out. Now I want you to consider something. At this point, I shared this last week, so I'm going very fast through this. The best of the best of the best of the best would be selected to go to the next step, and that was Talmudim. And the tal, uh, to be a Talmud means you, you would be a disciple of a certain rabbi, and the certain rabbi you would make application to study under him, and you say, well, weren't you studying under a rabbi? Yes, you were studying under a local rabbi, but there were those that were called to have, and they were believed to have authority. Remember, we talked about that last week. And those that were, were with authority had a national reputation, and they also had what was called a yoke. And a yoke was their particular way of interpreting the Old Testament laws and the scriptures and the, and the teachings of the prophets. And so they had a way of interpreting this and they would pass it on. They would pass, it was said that they were passing their yoke, their yoke or the keys or the, the yoke of the kingdom of God. They would pass it on to the very next generation. And the way they would pass it on is they would take on disciples. You would be called to be a Talmud. And so if they heard of you, they could, they could try to recruit you. But more than that, you would apply to their school. And most of, the, most of the times it meant leaving your home, leaving your, your comfort zone and going to them and learning their yoke. But this is what they wanted to know. They wanted to know, does this young man have what it takes to, to hold up my yoke, but not only that, to pass it forward? I want you to think about this with me for a second. To pass my yoke forward and you say, but this is only the best of the best of the best of the best. Yes, that means most of the people were already back home, what? Learning their parents' craft. You would be back home learning how to fish, learning how to tan leather, learning how to blacksmith, learning how to repair this or do that or make baskets or, or, or whatever it is that you were doing, ranching, farming. You would be learning your parents' craft. But those who were selected, the very best of the best of the best, would be standing before a rabbi looking to be taken on as a Talmud. And so it would go something like this. You would be there and this rabbi would say, I wonder if this young man has what it takes and so I'm looking at this young man, Cody, and I begin to ask him questions. And as he answered the questions, I want to know, does he get the essence of my yoke? Does he understand the yoke that will be put upon him? Because this yoke needs to define his life, and this will be passed on to the next generation. So I can't make a mistake. And as I, I began to, to understand who he was and what he was about, I would make a determination. I would say, yes, this young man has it, or no, he doesn't. And I might say, no, you know what? He's a good young man, and he's got a lot of good qualities, but he just doesn't have it. And so then I might say something like this, Cody, thank you very much. And I see that the love for the scripture is, is a priority to you. And I appreciate that. And thank you for answering my questions. But you know what? I think you'd be best served going back to your father's house and learning his craft and learning from the, fa the family business and just go and dedicate yourself to that. But what if there was another young man by the name of Tyler and Tyler came up and, and he made application and we began to draw a relationship and I began to ask him questions and as he answered, I say to myself, this guy, he's got it. He's got what it takes. He has that certain something. Then I might say something like this. I think he can... I think he can get this yoke. I think he can carry it. I think it won't be too much for him and I think he can pass it forward. So I would say, Tyler, would you... Follow me. I want you to think about this with me for a second. Don't those words ring familiar? Come, follow me. 
And so what that meant is that Tyler would say, he would leave everything. He would go home, kiss his mom and dad goodbye, and he'd say, I'm going to study with Rabbi so-and-so. And and he would leave his comfort zone. He would leave what was familiar. He would leave what was secure. And he would give everything it took to not only follow, but to learn how to walk in his ways, how how to put his feet where the rabbi put his feet, put his hands where the rabbi put his hands think the way the rabbi thought and feel the way the rabbi felt in his heart. He would do anything it took to become like his rabbi. He would dedicate his life to do that. And so this is what was literally happening as the rabbi would move from town to town or he would go and teach in a certain place. His disciples, his Talmuds would be right there by him, getting dirty when he got dirty, getting his hands wet when he got his hands wet, doing everything his rabbi did. And so as they went from town to town, it was said that they would get dirty with the same dust that the rabbi got dirty with. The same puddle the rabbi stepped in, they would step in. The same stuff, stuff he got on his shoe, they would get it on their shoes, and they would be covered in the same dust the rabbi was covered in. And so some of the sages and the wise men would say something like this, it became known May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. What, did it, what does it mean to be covered in the dust of your rabbi? It meant you're going to follow him so closely and you're going to give your heart so profoundly to it that nothing, nothing this rabbi does will escape you because you're going to be right there with him lockstep. That's what it meant to be covered in the dust of the rabbi. Now can you see what what Jesus was all about and what would be covering his feet? Listen to this. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Where is is his feet going to be taking him? He's saying right up front, he's saying, you want to know where I'm going to be going, boys? I'm going to be going to the least of the least. I'm going to be going to the dirty. I'm going to be going to those that are in the gutter. I'm going to be going to those that need me most. I'm not going to those that are already well. I'm going to those that are sick. I'm going, and I'm going to mix it up in the dirtiest parts of this world. That's where I'm going. So I want you to consider this with me for a second. These boys have been brought up understanding this system and so a new rabbi comes to town and he walks into their town and he goes to this very same lake this very same lake that Jesus is walking on now the lake of Galilee and he gets in a boat and he pushes off from the shore a little bit and begins to teach the Bible says and he teaches so profoundly that people are moved and healings begin to take place and all of these things are happening but as he's teaching there's some boys over here off to the side and they're cleaning their nets they're cleaning their nets because they had just finished fishing all night and they caught nothing. John, have you ever fished and caught nothing? That look is a look of, unfortunately, one too many times. How many of us have ever fished and caught nothing? You know, and I hate that saying, that's why they call it fishing and not catching. That doesn't make me feel any better. I still like to catch. And so they had been out there all day, all night long, and they caught nothing. And now this rabbi, he gets done with his preaching, and it's probably around noontime. And what do you know about noontime in the Middle East? Nothing other than it's probably really hot. And so he looks over at the boys that are fishing, and he says, okay, I'm done, but guys, can you do something for me? Do you mind going and fishing again? And they're thinking, really? And he says, Peter, is that your name? He said, yes, sir, that's my name. He says, Peter, why don't you and your brother, why don't y'all go to the deep part of the lake, put your nets down one more time for a catch? And you know, I love Peter because he was raised right. He was raised to respect rabbis more than anything. And, but, but he says, Rabbi, you know a little something about fishing, I mean, about about." teaching God's word, but I know a little something about fishing. And so I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you this, that, that are you sure you want me to do this? Because we've just fished all night and we've caught nothing. 
And so Jesus says, not only am I sure, but I want you to go to the deep part of the lake. And Peter's thinking in his mind, you see, the reason we fish at night, Rabbi, is because when it's so hot, the fish go deep, deep, deep. And there is no way with our nets, we don't have sophisticated pulleys. This is ancient world. We just drag them on the surface. There's no way we're ever going to get the what? The fish, they're too deep. So we usually fish in the shallow at night when the fish come up to feed and it's what? It's cool. And so then our nets can drag and we can catch. Rabbi, what you're asking me to do makes no sense. Nevertheless, at your command, my master, I will go. Because he was taught to respect Rabbi so much. Now listen to this. He goes out there, and as soon as he gets out to the deep part of the lake and he drops down his nets, the fish begin to jump in. And the fish jump in, so many of them that he begins to sink, that he has to call his friends over to help him. And as he's calling, as he's calling his friends over to help him, they begin to get so full, and now they're having trouble. And he realizes, this is no ordinary rabbi. This guy's like no rabbi I've ever encountered. And so he gets back to the shore and he's talking to Jesus and now he's not calling him Lord. He's not, I mean, excuse me, he's not calling him master as he did earlier. He said, yes, master, at your command, at your wish, I will go and do it. Now he's saying, oh Lord, depart from me. I am a sinner. Depart from me. I am a sinner. And it's this, at this time that Jesus says, come, follow me. But wait, you haven't understood if I can carry your yoke. You haven't understood if I have what it takes. Wait, if you see, I'm not studying that anymore. I got washed out like at the first step. I didn't make it to the end. I, I've been fishing for years. I got washed out of the program a long time ago. Thank you for your invitation. But, but you know what I love about this? Peter says, heck yes. He drops his nets. He goes, I've just been called to study with a rabbi. I'm going to go get dusty with him. And I want his dust all over me. I want to walk where he walks. I want to, you know what? He says, Andrew, come follow me. James and John, the two buddies that went and helped, you two, come follow me. And he began to call out. Certain young men saying, come follow me. You think they understood what the word follow me meant? It meant come. Be my feet, be my hands. Have my mind become your mind and my heart become your heart. That's what it meant. That's what it meant. Where did his feet go? The Bible tells us in John chapter 4. In John chapter four, there's an interesting story there of Jesus, and he says this. He says, I must go through Samaria. In another version, it says, I needs go through Samaria. What does that mean? He's saying, my feet must get dusty with the dust of Samaria. And there's one thing we know about Jewish men. They would do anything to avoid going through Samaria. Why? Because Samaria was the place where the people had once been Jews, but they had intermarried and completely compromised the Jewish way. And so they would do anything to go around this place. They would travel miles out of their way to go around. So when his disciples hear, we must go through Samaria, they're thinking, what? But Jesus is saying, I want you to learn what it is to go out of your way for one person. You say, who did he meet there? Did he launch a revival there? Yes, but he did it by meeting one person. He met one woman who had had five husbands and was living an immoral life, and yet he touched her there, and he says, she has a date with destiny, and my father has told me to be there, and I will do anything it takes. I must, I needs go through Samaria, and I want you to follow in my footsteps. That's where his feet went. The same feet that are walking on water now went through Samaria. These same feet we find in John chapter 13, verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. For so I am, he says. And if I then, 
Your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So I want you to consider this with me. This is the night he's being betrayed. They have been walking with him. They have followed close by their master, by their rabbi, getting his dust on them doing the things that he's doing, putting his hands where his hands were, walking where his feet went, understanding the way he thought and feeling the way he felt. And here they are, they're all ready to partake of the Lord's Supper, to celebrate this sacred, sacred ceremonial feast in the Jewish tradition. And he walks in, and this is what I want you to get with me. He walks in, and what do you think the first thing he sees? Come on, Russell, stay with me on this. What do you think the first thing he sees? He sees his disciples, absolutely, which brings him joy to his heart because these are the guys that have been walking with me. They're becoming like me. They've, I've called them to, to walk the walk with me and they've been faithful. But he sees their dirty feet. He sees their dirty feet caked in the dust of their rabbi. But the one thing he shouldn't see is the dusty, dirty feet. Why shouldn't he see the dusty, dirty feet? Because this is the thing. If you are celebrating this particular Jewish ceremonial meal, it is unclean to sit at the table with dirty feet. And it is forbidden. And the last thing you should do is sit there with these dirty feet. You should clean. So this tells him something. You've learned to walk with me. You've learned to touch with me. You've learned to think like me. And you've learned to feel like me. But there's something still missing, guys. And we're here at the very last hour. And there's something still missing. Because you don't understand that my heart, my true heart is to serve. And to give myself away. And to think of myself less and of others more. That's my true heart. And here you sit with dirty feet. Because this is what happened. They each walk into the room. And in the Jewish tradition, this is what happens. The guy who is the least washes the feet. Well, when you got 12 guys that think they're all equal, or better yet, no, we're not all equal, but no one's really to admit who's who. Because listen, the closer they got to Jesus's betrayal, the closer they got to to the end, they started fighting about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who would have this seat and that seat and who could be the right hand man and who would be this and who would be that. So they walk into a room, they see, see, see each other with dirty feet and they're like, well, I'm not washing your feet. Well, you're crazy if you think I'm washing your feet. Thomas says, I doubt I'm washing anybody's feet. <laughs> Can you imagine James and John? James and John go, all I know is that me and my brother, we don't wash feet, right, brother? <laughs> so there they sat, and Jesus comes in, and he, and he begins to wash feet. He says, you want to be dusty like your rabbi? Then learn to walk where I walk, to touch what I touch, to think like I think and to feel what I feel. And the lesson is almost over. I'm about to die and I'm about to launch you out to take my yoke and to share it with the whole world. You guys gotta get this. You guys gotta get this. What was Jesus' heart? The Bible says we should have the mind of Christ, the same mind. Listen to what Philippians says, chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're supposed to have it be his feet, be his hands, be his mind, be his heart. Listen to what the Bible says about Jesus' heart. When Jesus heard 
what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Jesus had a heart of generosity, a heart of giving, a heart of doing whatever it took. One author says this, John Eldridge in his, in his wonderful book called Beautiful Outlaw says, says, Jesus gave till he had no more to give. He healed and he ministered and he gave early in the morning when he was woken up, he gave. At lunchtime, he gave. At supper time, he gave. By the roadside, he gave. On the roadway, he gave. At home, he gave. Abroad, he gave. In the wilderness, he gave. In town, he gave. At the city court, he gave. He gave to the point that there was nothing else he gave to give. He gave till he hung on a cross and said, I have nothing left. He gave and he gave and he gave. And this is what he's telling his disciples. If you truly want to understand the new way, the way I've been teaching you, you must learn to give. To give of yourself, even when it hurts. I want you to consider what's going on here, guys. What's going on here is he is about to feed the 5,000. But I need you to stay with me on this, would you? We've been talking about Jesus walking on water, and I'm going to tell you how this fits together. Thank you, Cody. The way this fits together is this. He withdrew to be by himself. The crowds heard that he was going away. They followed him, and they showed up before he got there. So he gets there and his heart is filled with compassion. Why? Because the crowd is many and they have so many needs and he heals and he ministers and he preaches and he gives himself away till there's nothing left to give. And then his disciples come to him and say, it's too late to send the crowds away. We must feed them. They haven't eaten. So he says, then let's feed them. What do we have to work with? We have one little kid's lunch. And those are the hands, his His disciples learned there to follow his hands and to be his hands. As Jesus broke, he gave, and then they broke, and they gave, and it just kept multiplying. And they kept watching this going, wow, look at what's what's happening. And he goes, now move your feet and go serve the people. As he touched people's eyes and they were healed, that they touched people's eyes and they were healed. As he spoke over someone and touched them and they came to life, then they touched and they came. And he began to show them in how to minister. And they followed him and they followed him and they followed him. And hear this last lesson about washing feet. He's telling them, not only do I want you to be my feet, not only do I want you to be my hands and to think like I think, but I need you to feel like I feel. Listen to the words in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of heaven and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. You know what the word compassion means? It means he was moved to the very core of who he was. It moved him so much that he literally felt it in the pit of his soul. Some say you're moved in your bowels, but you're moved in your heart. Do you know the heart has a feeling? Do you know the heart has a memory? There's a phenomenal thing going on in science today where scientists are trying to understand and study what's called heart memory. Now that we have, we have the ability to, to have tr- heart transplants, something unique has happened. Someone will have a heart transplant and these recipients are, are, are reporting all kinds of interesting things like they never had a feeling for such a thing, and now they do. They never had an inkling or desire, and now they have these desires, and they have these certain attractions, and they have these these feelings and deep movements for certain things. And they can only say what it might be because of the what? The other person's 
heart. Oh, all kinds of phenomenal things that we don't truly understand, even to the point that one young child received another young child's heart and began to feel things and see things and dream things to the point that it led this child, it led them to be instrumental in catching the other family's killer and make a positive ID. Some say, oh man, that's... I'm saying, let this heart that was in Christ be in you as well. You're supposed to have a heart transplant. Listen to what Ezekiel says. I will give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Paul says this, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, how? That you may know what is the hope to which you were called. John says this, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in him the same way in which he walked. If you say you love him, if you say you're his disciple, then walk where he walked. Get his dust on you. 1 Corinthians says this, be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ, said Paul. Peter put it this way. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. Paul says this to the church at Ephesus, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. You say, Pastor, you didn't finish the story of the walking on water. This is where we finish. So they're out there in the middle of the night. Jesus comes walking across and they think, is it a ghost? Somewhere they get the notion, no, I've been with my rabbi. I've been walking with him and talking with him. And I'm so close to him. That looks like his silhouette. I've told you before that if my son walked into the room and it was dark and all I could see was the outline of his, of his physique, I would know it was my son. He's got the long skinny neck, the bony shoulders. He's got just that little twist in one of his legs and he's got the big ears. And I could see, I know it was him, but could you recognize your Lord? They recognized him and they said, Jesus if it's really you, say something. And Jesus had one word. He said, come. And Peter said, I recognize that. Come, follow me anywhere. <laughs> no, I mean that. Would you recognize that? Come, follow me. The Bible says that his sheep know his voice. And he doesn't have to say a lot to them. All he has to say is, come. 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 And Peter said, I don't know about you jokers, but I'm going. We asked the question, why did Peter, where did he get that idea? What was Peter thinking? Peter said, no, listen, we're supposed to do everything we see our rabbi doing. Our rabbi's walking on water, I'm walking on water. I don't care what anyone says. My rabbi's walking on water. I'm walking on water. He gets out there and he begins to walk. And he begins to walk. And I can imagine his feeling as he walked and nothing happened. And he's walking on top of the water. And Jesus is probably smiling at him, enjoying this moment like a father enjoys the first steps of his son. Come on. And he's watching him. And Peter's like, whoa, this is awesome. And just then he begins to sink. And Jesus goes, I got you. Just like a father grabs his son before he hits the ground, he goes, I got you. And he pulls him back up, but he says this to him. He says, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you think Peter doubted Jesus? I don't know. Jesus is still standing firm on the water. Do you think he doubted Jesus after all that he's seen? Who, did he, who was he doubting? Where was the doubt? What was Jesus talking about? 
He was doubting himself, very good. So it's not he's saying, why did you doubt me? He's saying, why did you doubt you? And I get the sense that Jesus is saying here, no, I called you for a reason. I know the other rabbis passed you over. I know the other rabbis didn't think of you very much. I know you weren't a five-star recruit. You may have been a four-star recruit, but I saw something in you. Why do you doubt what I see in you? And some of us need to get that here today. Some of us need to really understand that not only should you believe in God, but you should understand that God believes in you. That God's not done with you. He called you for a reason. He called you for a purpose. And he's just getting started. What you have to do is believe him and walk with him and trust in him and get dusty with him and understand that God loves you. And he's saying this, I called you, Carlos, before the beginning of time. I called you before you even knew yourself. I knew you. How do we know this? Because we know that when he called Nathaniel... One of his disciples, Nathaniel, comes and he goes, oh, so you're the guy they're calling the Messiah. And he's kind of doubting. And and Jesus looks at Nathaniel and he says, Nathaniel, come follow me. I saw you under the tree while you were having your prayer time. And I saw the things you asked me. And I'm here to tell you it shall be done. But you come follow me. And Nathaniel hits his knees and goes, how do you know this? And he says, I know more than you could possibly understand you come follow me some of you need to hear those words for the first time like you've never heard them before come follow me not me Jesus Jesus and some of you need to say why need to hear him say why do you doubt In the world's eyes, you may have not been the best of the best of the best of the best. In the world's eyes, they may have passed you over, washed you out, but I called you. What do you think the Bible says? That he called you. You love him only because he first loved you. With every head bowed and every eye closed. It's the word. As the worship team comes up to sing, I'm going to ask you a very important question. Are you ready to follow your Lord? Are you ready to hear the words of Jesus say, come? If you are, you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Maybe some of you have already accepted him, but feel that today... He's reminding you not to just walk like him, not to just touch like him, not to just think like him, but to feel like him. To have a heart of service. You want to rededicate your life, re-engage him. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand too, but first I'm going to ask those that need Jesus as Lord and Savior, raise your hand right here, right now. Don't let anything stop you. I see your hand, young man. Anyone else? I see your hand over here on the side. Anyone else? I see your hand up here, Jacob. I see your hand. Anyone else? You're hearing the words of, of Jesus Christ for the first time. Say, come. Just three more seconds. Raise your hand. Don't let anything stop you. One. Two. I see your hand just. I see your hand right here. I see your hand right here with the tattoos. I see your hand in the back. Three. Now I'm going to ask you, if you're here today and you say, no, I, I heard that I heard that command a while back, but somewhere along the line I started to doubt. I need the hand of Jesus to pick me up again. I want to get back on that water. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Don't let anything stop you. I see hands going up. I see hands going. And this is what I need you to do. If you raised your hand today, would you do me a favor and begin reading through the book of John? This day, start reading through the book of John. 
Say, how much do I read? Read five chapters a night. Let's pray together. If you raised your hand to accept Christ, pray with me. Father, I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as Lord of my life. I give you everything, Lord Jesus. Change me and rearrange me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin. By the power of your Holy Spirit, guide me and lead me. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing with Raquel? I love you, Foundation.